meditation and satsang. Spiritual life is satsang. It is the company of truth. It is a relationship to one who lives as truth. Satsang is also the very nature of life. It is the form of existence, relationship, not independence, not separation, but relationship. So the principle of true life is relationship. All attempts to relieve the life of suffering by various means, remedies, do not produce truth. They may heal dis-ease, but only truth produces truth. Spiritual practice, sadhana, is to live satsang as the condition of life forever. Spiritual practice is not something you do temporarily until you get free. It is to live satsang forever, a lifetime of truth. The beginnings of one's spiritual life are the coming into relationship with the Guru, living in his company, which is satsang, living the conditions curated in that relationship, getting straight. There is a force, a city, a spiritual power alive in satsang. The earliest experiences of spiritual life are generally the sensations of force or presence communicated in satsang. These are enjoyed as various feelings, peace, prayers, which are spontaneous purifying movements, bliss, a sense of presence, the qualities of energy. But in truth, spiritual life is not something that happens, happens to you. It is not a process that takes place independent of your conscious existence. If it did, all you would need do would be to wait for it to come to an end in liberation or some such state. Spiritual life is conscious life. It doesn't really exist until your consciousness comes into play, becomes active. Spiritual life is an intelligent process. It is not a kind of mediumship wherein you simply enjoy certain experiences, certain energies, a certain Shakti. The Shakti or force aspect of spiritual life has one purpose. It is to communicate to you the energy alive in the truth, to purify, harmonise and intensify your life so this conscious process can begin. All of the Shakti experiences are simply means created to strengthen and intensify your life so that you have the energy, the force with which to live this conscious life. Sadhana is a process in consciousness. It is intensity. It is force of consciousness. It is intelligent. It is not just energy that you witness. Consciousness does not happen to you. All of you here tonight have begun to live satsang. To some degree, you are committed to it. You have begun to live it as the condition of life. Some of you have these experiences of force, of energy, of movement, internal awarenesses, various kinds of purification. In some cases, satsang appears simply as a very practical influence. But now it is time to begin to use this teaching which brought most of you here. I want to read you a couple of pieces from the Near of Listening, from the beginning of that portion called the process of real meditation. It is a long section. It gets into many of the subtleties of this affair of inquiry. I am only interested in getting into the very beginnings of it here 
because the beginnings of it are the practical affair which is the foundation and unending circumstance of real or spiritual life. He says, the usual meditation, traditional meditation, the motivated remedy, is only a consolation, an effect and a good feeling. It provides no radical reversal of ordinary consciousness, and when situations arise out of meditation, the person has no control over the process of identification, differentiation and desire. I spent years with all kinds of people who were going through the phenomena of yoga, of kundalini yoga, dealing with presence, force, miraculous spiritual experiences. I have never seen anyone fundamentally changed by these experiences. I was never thus changed by any of these experiences. Their intention is not to change you. They are change. They are phenomena only. They depend on the force, Guru Shakti, the force aspect of satsang. The phenomena themselves are not the point. They are there only to assist in the intensification of the quality of your life. You are not intended forever to sit on them, bathe in them and watch them perform. These phenomena, if they need to happen in you at all, will happen in any case. They are a relatively minor aspect of spiritual life. Enjoy them, but see that they are not themselves spiritual life. They will not lead to liberation. They are not truth. They will not affect the motivating character or source of your peculiar life one iota. Thirty years of Shakti experiences will occupy a fool but they will not awaken him. Increase of energy or experience does nothing whatsoever to the fundamental quality of conscious life. At most, it intensifies it, providing the functional strength so that conscious life can begin as a real process. He continues, only radical understanding avails. In other words, no motivated process, no simple influence of energy does. Only radical understanding avails. It is the viewpoint of reality itself. It is not attachment to some body, realm or experience that is seen as the alternative remedy, cure and source of victory. It knows that every motive and action is made of avoidance, thus it has no recourse except to understand. And understanding as well as the one who understands our reality, the self with a capital S, the bright. The yogic search only enjoys forms of Shakti, the bliss of energy. Only radical knowledge is real bliss, dependent on nothing. Understanding arises when there are true hearing and self-observation in relationship. Relationship here is ultimately a reference to satsang. Satsang is a relationship to the man of understanding or the guru, lived, made the condition of life. The person begins to become stronger, straighter under those conditions. Perhaps some of these phenomena, this energy, this shakti, become awake in him perform certain purifying activities, intensify him, and after a while he begins to listen. At first, there is simply the contact with his guru. When he becomes strong, more intense, he begins to listen to what is spoken in satsang. And after a while, he also begins to hear what is spoken. At first, he only listens, and what is said modifies his mentality in various ways. But at some point, he begins to hear. The communication takes place, in fact, and the sign of its having taken place 
is that it takes the form of spontaneous sub-observation. So understanding arises when there are true hearing and self-observation in relationship. He continues, Therefore, make use of such teachings as this present one and observe yourself in life. Observe yourself when you seek. Observe yourself when you suffer to any degree. Observe your motives. Observe the activity of identification. Observe the activity of differentiation. Observe the activity of desire. Observe the patterns of your existence. Self-observation under all conditions is the beginning of this process in consciousness. I was talking with one of you today and it was asked whether it was appropriate for someone simply to begin this inquiry avoiding relationship as it is described in the near listening right now reading the book why not just begin it but this intelligence that is understanding is a form of satsang it is satsang in another peculiar form this inquiry is satsang it is that same condition that we enjoy in the relationship to the guru but only in another form. Just so, there are subtle forms of this inquiry in which no mental inquiry takes place, but it is the same inquiry, and it is still satsang, and perfect understanding is itself satsang, perfectly realised and enjoyed. It never comes to an end. It is perfect inquiry, Inquiry going on eternally, absolutely. At some point, this verbal or mental inquiry becomes appropriate, but it is only one of the stages in a process. This form of inquiry is necessarily preceded by insight. It must first be made alive as intelligence, as real recognition in your own case. Then, instead of simply observing the quality of your life, you will begin to inquire of the quality of your life. A more or less passive quality in consciousness is replaced by a more or less active quality. But that actual inquiry, asking of this question, avoiding relationship, in a more or less formal way, is not appropriate at the beginning in most cases. Satsang must begin. The influence of satsang the condition of satsang must begin. You must begin to adapt to satsang, make it your sadhana, meet the conditions of spiritual life in a very simple way, take on the qualities of an ordinary pleasurable life, assume responsibility for the relationship that is satsang and begin to listen. You will simply begin to listen and you will simply begin to hear. When you begin to hear, when this process in consciousness has begun, you will begin to observe yourself, see yourself under the conditions of life. This process of self-observation carried on here in our discussions about this contraction or avoidance of relationship and in all your study, reading and living of this work, at some point becomes communication received, real observation of how, yes, this contraction, this avoidance, is the quality of your life. Therefore, this process of self-observation, as a result of hearing in satsang, of living in satsang, is the beginning of this process that becomes inquiry. Inquiry is not a method any more than satsang is a method. Inquiry, at some point, is the natural, spontaneous, intelligent activity of one who is living satsang. But first, he must hear and observe. Yes? Adidar continues. When you see that you are always seeking, understanding is emerging. When you see the pattern of narcissus as all your motives, all your acts, all your seeking, understanding is emerging. 
when you see you are always suffering, understanding is emerging. When you see that every moment is a process in dilemma, understanding is emerging. When you see that every moment is a process of identification, differentiation and desire, understanding is emerging. When you see that every moment, when you are at your best, as well as when you are at your worst, you are only avoiding relationship, then you understand. When you see that every moment, when you are at your best, as well as when you are at your worst, you are only avoiding relationship, then you understand. When you see that which already is, apart from the avoidance of relationship, which already absorbs consciousness prior to the whole dilemma, motivation and activity of avoidance, then you have finally understood. So this process of self-observation in satsang, which is a result of hearing in relationship to the man of understanding, grows and becomes insight, actual living intelligence. When you have understood, when this insight has become real, understanding will become the natural response of your intelligence to any experience, the total content of any moment. Then approach every moment with understanding and perceive the original truth within it. Devote some time in the morning and evening to conscious understanding and perceive the original truth within it. Devote some time in the morning and evening to conscious understanding. Sit down, turn to understanding and inquire of yourself as thoughts, feelings and movements arise within to distract you. Sorry, as thoughts, feelings and movements arise within to distract you. Inquire in the form of understanding. Avoiding relationship. When this insight has developed as a result of self-observation, initiated through hearing, under the conditions of satsang, this inquiry, which is then a form of the intelligence already alive in you, becomes appropriate. And a practical way to enjoy this intelligent activity is simply to set aside some time for it. Morning and evening is convenient. When you get up in the morning, that is convenient. Just before bed, that is convenient. Any time is all right, but such times are appropriate and convenient. Adidas says, do this for half, half an hour or an hour in the morning and evening when you rise from sleep or just before retiring. Do it also briefly at any moment in the day when strong distractions absorb you. Devote yourself to understanding in the midst of all experience, instead of any kind of remedial action that arises as a way to handle the problem of life in any moment. Make understanding and inquiry your radical approach to life. Become more and more absorbed in understanding and the cognition of present freedom. Understand and inquire until these things become realised permanently as your form. Enjoy and create according to the wisdom of your own form. The last two lines refer to the radical, most subtle forms of this process of inquiry. Yes? A number of people have asked me about this inquiry, avoiding relationship. Some of them want to use it immediately, simply because they read about it in the book. Some started to use it and found it very troublesome and problematic. Some started to use it as a method. But the only genuine use of it depends upon its having come into existence in you as your intelligence, which is a very different thing from reading it in a book. The inquiry depends on satsang. It depends on making satsang into radical spiritual practice, true sadhana, your way of life, the very condition of your life. 
enjoy the quality of satsang, the force of it, until you become free enough, so alive with the intensity of that force, that you begin to listen, which is to become spontaneously available to the intelligence of satsang. Then you will begin to hear what is said or otherwise communicated. All of this will take place in you and become self-observation. When this self-observation that is spontaneously awakening in you continues under all conditions of life, you will begin to observe this contraction of which I speak. You will begin to see this avoidance of relationship. It will become clear to you in your living experience. When it has become clear to you, when it takes place as a certainty, as your very knowledge, then that very knowledge can be used positively, directly. It becomes your approach to life. It is your intelligence. At that point, this inquiry begins. Examine this chapter on meditation in the mere listening. See what is involved in the beginnings of it. Our work is not the exclusive Kundalini Yoga. It is the all-inclusive, universal and perfect way of God. Many of you have become to many of you have begun to become sensitive to the energy, the force, the shakti of this work. And no doubt about it, there is a living force in satsang. This work is not simply an intellectual or mental liberation. The force alive in satsang, an intellectual or the force alive in satsang is the very force of the heart, the living reality. But it is not unconscious. It is conscious. And the way is conscious. True sadhana is an intense, forceful way of consciousness. So it is not a matter of former of forever receiving and blessing or darshan of shakti and allowing it to do things to you. Begin to listen. Accept the conditions of this relationship. Remove the ordinary obstacles. Abandon them. If you truly engage and use this relationship from day to day, more obstacles and more demands will be created for you than you could ever have imagined as a discipline for yourself. The relationship will discipline you. You don't have to be concerned with spiritual techniques, purifying methods, things to do to yourself, apart from responsibilities for practical maintenance of life, which were discussed with you when you entered the ashram. As you make satsang the condition of your life in a very practical way, you will begin to listen. You will begin to hear and you will begin to observe your own action, even your most subtle action. The, the real process of inquiry rests upon all of that. Therefore, a great deal is required of a man before this inquiry comes into play. It is not a method. It is not a form of morbid self-analysis. It is a form of real, living, spontaneous intelligence. It is itself already understanding the force of truth. So it simply does not arise as an option for you, as something of use to you, until it has become alive. First, there must be satsang and this activity in consciousness. Listen, there is this contraction, this avoidance. All men are living this avoidance of relationship. This is all anyone is doing. Nothing else is happening. Only this contraction of living and subtle forms. It is suffering. It creates by implication the notions men have about the very nature of life. This contraction implies a separate self, separate from the world and all other beings. The appearance of many much and separate me is an expression of our suffering. But the force, the intensity, the bliss of reality, with a capital R, persists and is felt even under the conditions of ignorance. Therefore, it appears as a drama of desire, the search for union between the separate me and the manyness. 
Every man's life is the drama necessitated by this fundamental contraction. Every man's life is the adventure he is playing on this contraction. Every man's life is bullshit. The drama of an ordinary life is without significance or real intensity. It is deadly ignorance. No truth. No satsang. Satsang must begin. Satsang must be enjoyed as a condition of life. Then the whole drama of which even traditional spirituality is a manifestation comes to an end, dies. This contraction becomes flabby and opens. The real force of conscious existence comes into play and becomes the way, the sadhana itself. Meditation is not something that takes place in the dilemma. Real meditation is not a method to get rid of your suffering. It is not perpetual preoccupation with your own thoughts, the content of your life, in order to get free of them, get inside from them, make them be quiet. The you who does all of that is itself the dilemma. It knows nothing. It is, it is itself the suffering. It is itself obsession with the endless stream of its own thought. Therefore, the attempts by such a one to do something about his mind, to make it quiet, to make it see visions, whatever are within the form of this original motivating dilemma. Such strategies are expressions of his separate life, attempts to fortify and save his separate life, which is already an illusion. Real meditation arises only in satsang, only under the conditions of truth already lived. There is force in such meditation. Real meditation is an intense fire. It is a marvellous intelligence, a brilliance, a genius, a living force. It is not a pious attempt to quiet your little thoughts. It blasts the hell out of these thoughts. From the point of view of the self, the truth, the real, there is no concern for all of these thoughts all of these dilemmas, all of this mediocrity of suffering, it is nothing. When satsang lives as the principle of your life and truth becomes the form of your meditation, it consumes thought. It is a presence under which thoughts cannot survive. It is an intelligence that needs only to look at some obstruction for it to dissolve. This is the process that comes awake in satsang, not some method, some remedy. The whole point of view of dis-ease is false. Spiritual life is not a cure. Spiritual life is the life of truth. Satsang, one who is looking for a cure, is obsessed with his disease. The first true thing a man does when he comes into contact with the guru is to relax the obsession with his disease, his trouble. Therefore, the original activity a man enjoys in relation to his guru is not this sophisticated meditation, this inquiry. What he does is nothing very sophisticated at all. He comes and relaxes his search. He begins to find himself in the condition of truth in satsang. He begins to enjoy that condition in a very practical way, enjoying the force of it, the intensity of it, the beauty of it, the blissfulness and happiness of it. Only then does he begin to hear, observe and become intelligent, sophisticated. Yes? So the beginnings of satsang may last for a very long time. The more a man persists in the drama of his resistance, the longer he prevents satsang. If a man comes into association with one who, is, who he suspects might be alive, functioning as guru, but spends the next 40 years wondering about it, he has never entered into satsang. Satsang is not simply coming into a room and sitting. Satsang is the relationship itself the relationship to the heart, the self, the guru, the paradoxical person of the man of understanding. The drama of avoidance of relationship to the guru 
is the paradigm, the epi epitome, the archetype of all the dramas played in all relationships. It is better if, upon meeting his guru, a man surrenders his search and enters suddenly into that relationship. But in most cases, there is a period of time, of drama, of wondering, of in and out, of yes and no, of wondering again, of thinking, none of which is spiritual life. None of that has anything to do with spiritual life. It is only the drama of suffering, resistance, reluctance. Spiritual life begins for a man or woman when that relationship openly becomes the condition of his life. Then he becomes willing to accept the conditions it demands of him. He begins to enjoy the force of that presence, that satsang. He becomes alive, intense with that force. Then this activity in consciousness begins to awaken. Observe your connection here. Examine your relationship to this one. See the drama you are playing in terms of this satsang and live this satsang instead. I am only interested in this satsang as a real process. I have no interest whatsoever in gathering an enormous organisation of silly, fascinated people. I am concerned that this real process begins, in fact, in whomever it is possible for it to begin. If there is no one, I will stay home. If there is only one, I will deal with one. If there are 50, it will be 50. If there are 50 million, that is fine too. But I am not willing to do what is necessary to acquire a following through promises, methods, consolations, illusions and one-shot liberation baloney. Conditions are continually being created for you here and these conditions are always appropriate. They are the pure instruments of self-knowledge. But if you don't live this relationship, this satsang, it will always be an offence to you. It will always create an obstacle for you. Then satsang will only make you angry and uncomfortable. Live this satsang. Learn the real conditions of spiritual life. Observe your resistance to it. Be purified of your seeking. Understand and surrender this search. Lead an ordinary, pleasurable life. Remove exaggerated, self-toxifying practices in your life. All the absurdities, the forms of self-intelligence. Become more sophisticated with your desire. Come here as often as you can. Simply sit in this relationship. Enjoy the force of it. Begin to observe yourself. Ask me questions about your sadhana, not the usual questions. Where is George Washington today or what is the shape of the next universe? These are not your real questions. What do you care about all of that? That is not the point. You are suffering only. If you have to fly a rocket between here and Mars, then it becomes a practical necessity to discuss what the conditions are between here and there. When you are elsewhere, it is appropriate to consider what it is like in other worlds. After death, it is appropriate to examine what it is like after death. If you are dying this evening, then we can deal with the death process. But you are only suffering. You are resisting satsang. I've lost whatever I think I was falling asleep. Live this satsang. Learn the real conditions of spiritual life. Observe your resistance to it. Be purified of your seeking. Understand and surrender this search. Lead an ordinary, pleasurable life. Remove exaggerated, self-toxifying practices in life. All the absurdities, the forms of self-indulgence. Become more sophisticated with your desire. 
Come here as often as you can. Simply sit in this relationship. Enjoy the force of it. Begin to observe yourself. Ask me questions about your sadhana, not the usual questions. I've read all that, haven't I? Ultimately, all of this avoidance of relationship is only the resistance to satsang. It is a resistance to make satsang the condition of life. It is dramatised in relation to the guru because whatever he is in reality, he symbolises satsang or spiritual life. Therefore, people feel very free to aggravate their relationship to the guru, but they should be approaching their own ignorance, their suffering. Come to satsang with real need, not with anything to defend. The world is absolutely insane, but your spiritual life does not depend on the world. You are not going to get up from satsang today and suddenly find that everything and everybody in the world is absolutely beautiful. You are not going to find that all your suffering has been taken away by magic. The world is going to create obstacles. The world does not want to function. People do not want to function. They are not yet alive. If you are coming alive in satsang, you are going to have to be intelligent in your relationships, intelligent in life. Require truth. Take yourself to satsang, the company of truth. Don't believe the usual company of life, of resistance, of avoidance. The world will create conditions that will awaken your own ag ag aggravation, your own ignorance, your own gain. It will demand your game of you. It will demand that you suffer it and that you live it as well. When a person is still weak, still beginning, the world seems a vast alternative to this spiritual discipline and to truth. The patterns of sudden desire seem so much more pleasurable than this sadhana. Therefore, especially in the beginning, a man must make good use of the company of his guru and his ashram. When he becomes stronger, he will also make good use of the world. It's, it's 14 more pages. So satsang is this company of happiness, of real happiness. Satsang, this connection to the guru, is already happiness. This connection is taking you away from self-contraction. The self-contraction can be very subtle. It's not always obvious but everyone is doing self-contraction. Only in satsang can the self-contraction be removed. Only in this living relationship can this self-contraction be no longer. There is no contraction when in satsang. Satsang is truth. Satsang is our inherent condition. Satsang is for life, just as, just as air is for life. If people said you've got to breathe air every day of your life, then you think, oh, God, I've got to do all that work with all my life. As if you weren't breathing, as if breathing wasn't natural. But that's what some people have to do, isn't it, with... Um, kidney trouble or other trouble, they're fixed to a machine for the rest of their life. In diabetes 1, people have to do something for the rest of their life. Well, satsang is for the rest of one's life. Why should it be treated to be something we're not meant to do? See, people think that they can live as they are, as they have a right to live as they are. Well, when you're in satsang, you realise that this troublesome human being, this body-mind that's contraction, 
it's not good to live as that. But in satsang, one's life becomes very human, very normal, very ordinary, very disciplined. Just, just is. These are the natural results of being in satsang. One is already in intimacy. Thank you for listening. I'll read the next section maybe another time.